No, thank you very much, Michelle. <laughs> you know, thank you, Marty. Thank you, Pete. And thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to this wonderful session. And it's wonderful to share the stage with some of the most remarkable people. But um, let me tell you, uh, in addition, uh, Michelle is right. I am a physician. I have an MD. Um, and uh, I still practice. I'm a professor and um, an attending neurocritical care physician at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So I am still, uh, I still, a couple of months ago, I was, I was in the ICU taking care of patients and I took care of COVID patients. So I know the, I know the landscape. Um, in addition, uh, I wanted to let you guys know that I also have a PhD in medicinal chemistry, pharmacology from Cornell. So I am a New Yorker. I am a Stuyvesant High School grad. So, <laughs> so, so, so I I'm hold that against you. <laughs> you, know, you must be Bronx High. So, <laughs> so I, I am a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. So I'm very, very pleased to be back. So you have more degrees than a thermometer, is what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be here back home again, as it were. So today, what we're going to talk about is this new approach that uh, is based on DARPA, initiated DARPA funded technology. And that technology we call pharmacy on demand or pod, and you will hear about it. And that technology is gonna be the, uh, the impetus to create a new healthcare revolution. And that is medications as a service, no longer medications as a commodity. Now, why is this important, you might ask? Uh, next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please, uh, Chelsea. Fundamentally, it boils down to this. Patients come to providers for two reasons and two reasons only. One, tell me what's wrong with me, diagnosis. Two, fix me, therapy. The vast majority of fixing patients is giving them a medicine. That's what it is. But guess what? Patients aren't getting the medicines that they need. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But this is just simply one symptom of a completely broken healthcare system. I don't have to tell you guys this, you know this. It is expensive, it is ineffective, and it's disequitable. These are known facts. We have to take the system that exists now and change it. People have tried, policy, lawmakers, entrepreneurs, everybody. But let's be clear today, February, 2023, that system is tragically broken. We have to blow it up. And the way we're gonna blow it up is we're gonna science our way out of it. The talkers can talk, the doers need to do. We're gonna science our way out of it. Now, let me tell you how the story began. It started in the most unlikely of places. It started on a mountaintop in Afghanistan in 2003. So in 2003, I was sent to Afghanistan. I was given the privilege of taking care of injured service members and Afghans. 80% of my patients were Afghans, 80%. And when I went back to Iraq in 05, 90% of my patients were Iraqis. Little known fact, the US military takes care of people. People, not just soldiers. When I was in Afghanistan, I wanna tell you about one particular patient I had. It was a young service member. He caught in a gunfight, got hurt pretty badly, <clears throat> severe brain injury, sent to our combat support hospital, 452nd, helicopter to us, and I had to take care of him. He suffered from the, a condition known as dysautonomia. And what that means is his blood pressure and his heart rates were going simply wild. They go up, they go down, they go left, they go right. I was unable to therefore evac him out of the country. 21 hours on an Air Force jet to Longstuhl, Germany, he would never have survived. I needed a drug called bromocryptine. It was an old drug, generic drug. Didn't have it. Instead, I had to use a workaround. I had to use drugs I did have. And I was barely able to manage to keep this kid alive. The Air Force, God bless them, knew that I had this problem. They went and found me a box of bromocryptine in some pharmacy somewhere, stuck in the pocket of a jet jock who then flew it to me in Afghanistan on my mountaintop. Oh my. The cost of that box of bromocryptine for that workaround must have been, I'm not joking, probably $300,000 in jet aviation fuel. But they brought it to me. The good news is I had my bromo, I gave it to the kid, I sent him home, I sent him back to the States. And I, by the way, I heard from his wife, he is now a veterinarian. So big success. Because the workarounds of something simple, like not having the right medication, and that happens every day in the United States today. It happens uptown, it happens downtown. We gotta fix that. So how, when I was up in Afghanistan, I said, this is totally unreasonable. This is not a sustainable model flying you know, F-16s to deliver medicines, that's just nuts. <laughs> So how in fact is another way to do this? Well, I fell back to my roots. 
my PhD. I said, I looked at the compound bromocryptine and it's very simple, very simple. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and a little bit of bromine and a little bit of nitrogen. If I had those simple compounds, I could make it myself with a chemistry set. And if I look at all the drugs in the pharmacopeia, they're pretty much like that. They're all made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So in other words, if I had eggs, butter and flour, mm. I can make a stone, I can make a biscuit, I can make a cake if I had an easy bake oven. So when I decided to come home, I said, it's time to make an easy bake oven for this. I needed to make a chemical factory in a box that I could take out there, take out there to my tent city hospital and produce any manners of medicines. And that was the idea. That is pharmacy on demand. So when I came home, I had the opportunity of joining DARPA and I launched this program. And I worked with three remarkable MIT engineers, Klaus Jensen, Tim Jameson, and Alan Marson, the, respectively the chair of chemical engineering and the chair of chemistry at MIT. And, and Alan, who's a senior professor. And I said, gave them this idea. And they said, yeah, we can do this. Let's do this together. And we in fact did that. They were able to build a machine with the chemistry, very important, that allowed us to make, at the end of that little brief program, 14 different medicines. And the machine is the size of an apartment refrigerator. The size of an apartment refrigerator runs on 110. 110. In other words, it can be made solar powered. So with that, next slide. Next slide, please, Chelsea. I realized that the problem I was trying to face in Afghanistan, a drug shortage and multiple workarounds could be solved with science. But I find that I can do the same thing here in the United States. I practice medicine at Johns Hopkins, one of the finest hospitals in the country. What do we face? 250 to 300 drug shortages per year for the last two decades. You cannot get Petrosin in some parts of this country. It's the only <clears throat> drug you need to induce uterine contractions to, for, to advance deliveries. In other words, if you don't have Petrosin, you need to shut down your labor and delivery ward. That is happening in the West. That is happening in the West. I'll tell you that right now. If you don't have Dobutamine, an old drug, you cannot take care of congestive heart failure patients. You cannot get dobutamine in the parts of this country right now because of drug shortages. Mm. The consequences, you guys know. The workarounds, like getting it from a supplier from somewhere whose quality is somewhat suspect to get people to try to do their own compound and try to people do all these workarounds is costing the healthcare system at least minimally a half a billion dollars a year. And is it impactful? 90% of the prescriptions are generics. Anyways, yeah. A hundred percent of those generics, 100% has to be touched by a foreign agency someplace along its chain. Has to be. Has to be. And 85% of those critical medicines where there's no substitute, this is defined by the FDA, by the way, not me. 85%, if there's trade disrupted with China, you're screwed. You're screwed. And it may not matter to you, but if you had cancer, it may matter. If you had heart disease, it may matter. It should matter. We got to science a way out of this. Next slide, please, Chelsea. So to do that, I assembled the best team I possibly could find. I brought in Eugene Che, professor of chemical biomedical engineering at Virginia Commonwealth University, a DARPA alum. I brought in Tyler McQuaid, professor of organic chemistry at Cornell and a DARPA alum. John Lewin, pharmacy executive. He ran the inpatient pharmacy at Johns Hopkins. He was a senior officer of the American Hospital uh, the Society of American Hospital Pharmacists. Carrie Stever, a nurse executive. She ran global health initiatives. And, Al, and Andrew Bryan, another DARPA alum who ran over a half a billion dollars of federal contract money per year for the agency. I brought these wonderful people together to then take this remarkable prototypic MIT created technology and advanced development. We took it out of the university and had to move it forward. Next slide, please, Chelsea. And it is just today. Pod, pharmacy on demand is the revolutionary new pop paradigm. It is so that you can make whatever medication you need, when you need it, wherever you need it, or whoever you need it. It's based on technology, machines as I saw it. It's based on chemistry, but I'm a chemist, I'm a chemist. Give me a chemistry set, I can make you anything. It's a, we're chemists. 
And what I mean by anything, I mean key starting materials that right now are largely sourced from China. Make the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Turn that active pharmaceutical ingredient into a patient ready medication. The only thing the hospital cares about, the only thing I care about when I'm in my ICU is it coming in a syringe, is it coming in a bag, is it coming in a pill. That's what I want as a doctor. But to get there, you got to start making it. And there's many steps to make it. And we've developed an approach that can start anywhere in that pathway. Depends on what the needs are. What does that give the provider? One, obviously, agility. Today I need dopamine. Tomorrow I need levofed. The next day I need petrosin for my, my young lady that's in labor. It doesn't matter. Whatever you need, you should be able to make. Agility, agility. Two, quality. My workarounds take me to some ungodly places in the world. You do know here, when they talk about some of the drugs that came in from COVID, they were coming from some very usual places, which by the way, the FDA never inspected. Never inspected. They have no jurisdiction outside the 50 states. None. Zero. If they want to inspect a plant in China, they've got to give them three months advance notice that they're going to show up. Three months. Three months. So talk to FDA and they'll tell you what the problem is in terms of quality. They have no idea. We do. We do. It's customized. What your hospital at Sinai needs may be different than what Cornell needs, may be different than what LIJ needs. <clears throat> Now, each provider taking care of their patients knows what they need and they should be able to respond immediately. No time to go downtown and look for some patrols and you have a lady who's at 10 over 10 at plus three station and ready to pop that kid. You got to have it right then and there. So we have created with our technology and our technology, again, let me reiterate, it is hardware, the devices, it is chemistry, the wetware, it is regulatory management quality system. You can't put a thing out into a person without an FDA saying it's okay. You have to have that quality. You have to have that regulatory strategy. That's all part of this package that we put together that you see there. And we tuck it inside, inside of a trailer that is a sterile environment or what the FDA calls CGMP or current good manufacturing practices. So that out of a little window for the doctors and nurses, pops that patient ready medication. What, That's what matters. What about quantity? How, in terms of quantity, are you gonna to get to that? All right. I'll get to that. So uh, well, I'll answer it right now. My little machine, it depends on the, 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 the drug, right? And it's because it's dependent upon the potency. Let's talk about a drug called Nimbex, which, which uh, they didn't have here in uh, New York City. It's a paralytic needed for uh, uh, patients on ventilators, all right? Nimbex. My little machine can make enough Nimbex in a single day to meet the entire U.S. demand, the entire U.S. demand. The goal isn't to have this thing making enough; is to make a little bit that um, uh, that St. Luke's needs, and then make the next thing, and make the next thing, and make the next thing. He can make forty million doses of fentanyl a day, enough for about half the demand of West Virginia. <laughs> but now where are you? Where are you? But, <laughs> where are you sourcing the ingredients from? It depends on. The, it depends on the situation. I'm a chemist. Yeah, I know. If I can't get it, if I can't get it from China, India, the typical places, I, I, I know I can source further back in, the, in the, uh, the synthetic pathway that I can source from the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Why? Because they have a robust petroleum industry for the aromatic compounds, and we have a robust ag industry for a lot of the inorganics that I might need. And are you storing those somewhere or, or you'd have to go call? We, we can talk about more of this uh, oh, a separate yeah. time. Okay. Cause I don't, I don't want, but your questions are spot on. I'm more than glad at a second meeting to give you the entire, in fact, I invite you to come down and see it. This is not Theranos. I invite you to come down and see it. This because was done. You, on, you sound more like my dad was a pharmacist and he used to make drugs with his thing there. And you sound exactly. This is apothecary. Uh, this is apothecary. No, yeah, no, this right. is the, a full circle. Pharmacists yeah. were apothecaries. This is apothecary. Yeah. Next slide, because I don't want to. I don't want to take every time. You mentioned experience. You have, you have to have twenty minutes. So uh, you mentioned oh. extremely potent drugs. You know when you mentioned fentanyl, yes. etc. But what happens with drugs that we need in bulk? That's right. So let's say you needed something like Cipro, for example. Cipro is two hundred fifty milligrams a tab. Uh, Doc, I know you know that. And so you need two of those a day. 
All right. The machine right now, we already know that full till to put out about about 1,200 uh, Cipro pills a day, 1,200 Cipro pills a day. That's enough for 600 people. Now, if you're making it just for St. Luke's Hospital, a very good sized hospital just up the road here, they don't need 600 tabs a day. They don't. They're not taking here 600 patients, excuse me, 600 patients that need Cipro a day. So the point is, is that at the, at the point of care that we're talking about, Doc, it is, it, it, it more than suffices. But if you want two of these machines, we'll give you two of these machines. And who assumes liability? We do right now. We do right now. And, you, and, and you, you, you've gotten all the rates from the FDA? I am so transparent with the FDA. I'm a govy. So, so we have, from DARPA's standpoint, we have a whole team assigned that are working hand in hand with ODP. And that was because obviously we need to have that happen, right? So that is, I mean, and we're going piece by piece on this. So there's also the manufacturing aspect of it. So that's what we have. It's a whole team. Let me, let me point out, Can, um, FDA Commissioner Hahn physically came and visited us. <laughs> physically came to visit us. I've got photos of it to prove that I'm not crazy. The, the other thing too, is that we have the ETT, which is the Emergency <coughs> Emerging Technology yeah. Team of FDA, who meets with us regularly. And they've been, we're fully transparent. They have you're access to everything. The process of the FDA clearance. Yeah, yeah I am. Yet. No, correct. No, December of 2023. December of 2020, we expect our first approval. December of 2023. And is this only for off patent uh, generic? At the moment, yes, but I'm in, I'm in discussions with proprietary manufacturers with the concept of this. If we well, widely distribute our machines, then they don't have the capex of making the, the drug. That's number one. Number two is, this is really key, is that um, they make their money on introducing new, new proprietary drugs. They own that. I don't own that. So they'll charge whatever they're going to charge. I cannot control that. I don't legally. I can't touch that. But I can make their drugs for them. Just to jump in for one second, because I have the great honor to be uh, Dr. Ling's outside counsel for ODP, and we've known each other for a number of years, and it's uh, proud of that. Very excited. Just imagine for the family offices that hopefully see this presentation. Right now, it's February 2023. We get the first approval on January. Everybody knows from the FDA. Everybody knows what's going to happen. The inflection point is going to be significant once you get that. There's one of 22, 23 initial requests. That pod that you saw at Northwell outside the hospital, that pod is going to be much smaller. It's going to be everywhere throughout the United States and globally. How do you switch from one medication to another yeah. on one pod? I mean, you, that's you, you know, you, great question. You, you, you have to have different basic chemicals. You have to flush. You have to purify. You have to make sure that there are no contaminations. I mean, parallel systems, parallel systems. I don't have to flush parallel systems. So what it is, what you need to come and see it. Each of the uh, plug pull reactors or PFRs, we call them, are about about this. So it's literally in a book rack shelf. We do continuous flow chemistry. That's how we do. We don't do batch. There's no cleaning of the vat in between. We use continuous flow. So you literally can. We don't scale up. We scale out. Right now. Uh, but Dr. <clears throat> White, I want to get it so that I can we use some of these PFRs, right, at some point. Mm -hmm. And, but look where we are, we're at a small What's scale uh, plug flow reactor, all right? How do, I, how do I control the rates of reaction? I mean, this is basic chemistry, right? Pressure and temperature. I can run up much higher temperatures and pressures in a big factory because I'm working at a small scale. If it blows up, it's not gonna kill a million people. So that is how you can also do a clean cycle. If you do a clean cycle, and you know this, if you can go ahead and take what your, your solvents are or solutes are, turn them, basically, you know, incinerate them at high temperature and high pressure to push them through, you can actually get some really good uh, ultimate cleaning cycles. But that's, you know, that's for tomorrow, not for today. I'm talking about 2023. You know, I'm talking about what is our first iteration going out. And so, uh, but your point is well taken. And those are things that we're working on. You're going to have to have a large cadre of personnel flying between or going between these yeah, various I installations. I was about to say, what, yeah. is your, what is your logistics? You have an Amazon-like logistic from what in terms of developing and putting these in all the places, as well as your point about distributing the information. How, how does that get done? Right, so the way it, it works right now is we see it as a, a, as a plug and replace. You have a pod system that needs servicing, we pull it, we put in a new one because they're small and we just take it back and fix it, right? That's number one. So we're not gonna do on-site things. The second thing is in terms of the, uh, the amount that you need, if you actually scale it down, how much, how much 
Mimbex, you need a day, seriously, to manage a very large hospital, say Columbia Presbyterian. Just do the math, right? Honestly, 100 milligrams. 100 milligrams, right? That's a packet of sugar. How much do you need of some of these other, like the fentanyl? You actually need one milligram. So the logistics of which you speak of, you think on a large hospital, uh, a factory scale, I'm talking about a small thing. I'm talking about how do you service your printer at home? Mm -hmm. And that's conceptually how we're doing this. Okay, so are there, are there uh, in terms of the various hospitals in every city, in every town, in every is the distribution, is there a hierarchy of distribution? So you go out to Northwell out here on Long Island, then you go to some place in Denver and whatnot. So is there, a, is there an idea that you want to get to the top markets, top hospitals, and then go down or what? So I, may I share, I'll share that with you. All right. Uh, let me let me move forward and I'll share it with you. Sure. Okay. You so, need to do all the pricing and everything else. I'm well. going to talk about this. So let me, yeah, but but your point is well taken. It's actually built into the deck. So I want to, I want to get to it because I think other people. So uh, may I have the previous slide, Chelsea, please? So what we envision is exactly what you talked about is a network and not just in the US. I want to be clear on that. I, I see this as worldwide. I see this opportunity to actually take care of health disparities around the world. So I see it going through, and it's also informed by, you would ask, what? We have something that uh, a proprietary AI-driven supply chain analytical tool that we developed is proprietary to us that allows us to surveil the entire supply chain. It allows us to find out where some of the source material might be and in what quantity. It allows us to find out where the API markets is, the active pharmaceuticals. It tells us what drugs are out there and what quantity they're in. It allows us to do all these things. This, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, software monitoring packet that we have. But what it allows us to do is know six months ahead of time, what is gonna be short and where? What is gonna be short and where? And allows us to be proactive rather than reactive. Well, yeah, uh, what's the basis of that? You have like a predictive model that looks yeah, like absolutely. supply chains? Yes, yes. And in fact, the FDA is using ours right now. What have you learned from, what have you learned from <laughs> supply chain problems during the last 24, 36 months? Oh, uh, one of the things we learned was that the, uh, all roads lead to China. Sorry? All roads lead to China. Mm -hmm. If you want to make an API, you need key starting materials. You want to make a final drug product that depends on an API made in Switzerland, they need China because they need to make it. All roads lead to China. Why? A Sinochemical. Sinochemical is the largest chemical refining uh, consortia in the world, government owned, I might add. It's bigger than DuPont. It's bigger than Dow together. And what is your regulatory concern about that specific given with China? We can jump past them if we need to. Sorry? I can jump past them if we need to. You can jump past? Right. I can start with aromatics from the U.S. petroleum industry. I can get my inorganics from the ag industry, and I can make the key starting materials if needed. Can I do it cheaper than China with their 10% uh, labor? Of course not. But if you don't have a chemo agent, and you are in stage three can uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and you're going to die without it, Mm -hmm. It does change the discussion, doesn't it? If yeah. I can deliver it. And it changes it's a really value value uh, discussion of life. Right. <laughs> it, really, it comes down to it's either no choice or a choice. Well, so since so all roads lead to China, then your logistics model, which you just articulated, is a little different. It is different. But at the end of the day, we would have to balance and pivot on it. But if you can't get the, that, by the way, this starting material I talked about, you try to make a food additive, guess where you're going? You need to make a paint, guess where you're going? You need to make an adhesive, guess where you're going? I'm only talking about medicinals right now. I'm only talking about medicinals, but, uh, but think about it. And so, but because we're chemists, working at the scale we're working at, we can jump past that because if needed, if needed, I'm not saying I'm gonna do it all the time because that doesn't make economic sense, but if needed, can we? Have we shown we can do it? Have we demonstrated to DARPA that we can do it? The answer is yes, yes, yes. So it becomes an option, right? So there's one thing to sit there and say, oh, it's stupid, Jeff, because it's gonna to cost too much. You don't have the spot. If there is no alternative, mm -hmm. no alternative, we have a solution. We see the theme, we see the theme with the chip technology and stuff, just come back to the United States. Yeah. It's the same thing with the medicine. You just can't rely it's on it. It's a disintermediation strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that's what's in. Next slide, Chelsea, please. So just in terms of, since I'm talking to folks who are, are, are financiers and, and, and folks, uh, what's the, what, what is the market we're talking about? What is the market? The market in the United States alone is $300 billion a year. $300 billion. That's the total addressable market. Next. Right now, we're well on our way. I've already gotten two hospital systems that have agreed to deploy our device. Once we get, our, get past the FDA little hurdle, 
in 2024. So let me be clear here. What am I talking about deploying in 2024? Who are they? One is Northwell Health here in New York. And the other one is North Mississippi Health Services. Why North Mississippi Health Services, you would ask? Completely demogra different demographic. Those guys take care of a primarily indigent population. Primarily indigent population. 90% Medicare, Medicaid, and the demographics you guys know. The reason why I wanted to deploy there next is because, to, because number one is they have a need. They have a true need. During COVID, they didn't have the deep pockets to go ahead and bid on the open market with McCardinal and McKisson and the like to get the shortage medicine that. They had to do the workarounds that I did in Afghanistan. They had to do the workarounds I did in Afghanistan. And so it really annoyed them because why couldn't they have it? Because they're poor. And that is wrong. That is fundamentally wrong. So, but who are they? Are they just a bunch of, you know, you know uh, uh, country doctors? No, they've won the Baldrige Award twice. The Baldrige Award is given by the federal government, National Institute of Science, uh, Standards and Technology, NIST, to the top 1% performing quality hospital systems. They've the only hospital system to win it twice, I might add, the only one. So I come back to this. They had a need, Northwell had a need, different needs. But I'm telling you, the science and the technology I'm talking about is able to meet both of those needs without changing. The beauty of it is, and how did I know them? Because their chief medical officer served with me in the army. So that's how I knew them. How do I know all these other hospital systems you know there? It's because I know them. And John knows them. He was an executive of the, of the, uh, of the, the American Society of Hospital Pharmacists. We already have 29 hospitals, including the Navy, by the way, add the one, that have already agreed to be our beta sites starting in 2024, 2024. And we're in, in negotiation with 334 additional hospitals. So we're on our way to actually realizing this. Is it more uh, difficult to sell to the Northwells than the Northern Mississippi? No. So what, are your, what is your business model? What so the business product? model is a subscription. So okay. I'm not selling pills. Hold on. Oh. Price points and um, cost of goods. So you're essentially you're decentralizing a, a, a drug manufacturing factory. Um, your, your basic cost per production is gonna be much higher than a mass producing factory. So that- Is it? Yes, because you've got you, your, 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 your- your No economy to scale. Your, you don't get efficiency. Your but there's also no transportation expense. Hmm? Right. There's no transportation expense. Right. And I'm wondering well, if insurance pays is, for this. Is, 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 is well. it's, 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 it's very tiny. But what, what you're doing is, is you're giving us efficiencies of scale, massive amounts of drugs in a, in a single facility um, with smaller amounts of drugs disseminated with highly sophisticated machinery. With but they're tailored. What? The drugs are tailored. So yeah, so like right. so everything that's produced is, is mass manufacturing. It's not tailored to and the And it's need. not to the yeah. no, but you you've got to you've got to you've got to charge these hospitals something. And, but, and, and I'm your price points so are going to yeah, be let me go to the business. There's, there's, there's special, there's specialty the pharmacists, thing. right, who produce specialty drugs that are tailored to people's different needs, right? At different dosages, right? That's what you, you yeah, got it. When we get into the business side, use drugs at a much higher price than you get them generically. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, show, show. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, let's go into the business. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Hold on, Michael, one second. Yeah, so yeah. The, the doc is correct from that vantage point. The patient-ready medications, we already know what the VASS is. The, the Veterans Administration federal uh, scheduling uh, a schedule is for purchase, supply schedule, is what they purchase at, which is 75% of wholesale. So we know, we know the price and our COGS and all that stuff. I will be glad to go over those in detail with you really seriously at a second meeting. I would, in fact, I would welcome it. But the bottom line is this, patient ready medicines have a certain price point to it. That is where our entry is because we're producing patient ready medicines. The patient ready medicine is a tremendous markup, all right? And so it allows us, so I'll give you an example on, on, on doing chemistry our way versus the uh, one way. Let me use the example of Presidex. Presidex is a very important drug that is used for sedation, all right? China produces the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API, at $1.4 million per kilo. We can produce it for $20,000 per kilo. That's number one. Number two is the patient ready packaging of it is another five fold increase on its price. Five fold. 
we take advantage of that because we provide patient ready. We can jump over a lot of things because we don't have to ship our API to New Jersey to get it packaged from New Jersey to someplace else to get it put in the final syringe. Uh, we, we get rid of all that. We do it right there using our technology and, and we roll it back. What does that mean to a hospital? They're not inventory. They're not inventory. Look at how much a hospital has to throw out. And by the way, they just can't take it and flush it, uh, throw it in a dumpster. They actually have to pay somebody to get rid of their <clears> drugs. <throat> so they save all that. They, this just-in-time manufacturing and the savings on a workaround. What does a workaround cost them? If you're a cardiac hospital and you have a poor outcome, the insurance company's not going to pay you. That's $100,000. That's $100,000. And they're going to take a look and say, you used levofed when you should have used dobutamine. You absolutely should have used dobutamine, but you did it. But I couldn't get it. That doesn't matter to them. Okay. So who's the payor? The exactly. insurer? What's the, the hospital? So right now, it, the, the, right now, the pharmacy is a cost center. So it's all bundled. Right? If I manage a CHF patient, a congestive heart failure patient, the cost of the dobutamine is rolled into it. All right. So they, they, they're not like us going to Walgreens. So, so for a hospital... All the costs that go to take care of that patient, the CHF, all of it, it's the workarounds, everything is bundled into it. So if I can save them that money, save them that money, that comes to part of the calculus of why this is reasonable. And that's why Northwell and North Mississippi have already signed up. So you're not trying, if I'm correct. It's a service. You're not trying to disintermediate the hospital's pharmacy. You're trying to come in and say, okay, this is where you're short and we can produce it for drugs that you just don't have. Correct. Is that the value property? That is that is our entry point. Right. Yeah, but you get paid. Not only that, they had to get paid by somebody. You, you, yeah, 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 yeah. Of so who you you you're paid as part of the as part of the bundle that the hospital receives from the insurance company. So now the hospital and you have to decide what price the hospital is. So but you got, I, so the supply chain discrimination that you're doing, you can actually supply the logistics of that to each hospital as well. Correct. That's right. Like, so, yes. so they can they can kind of they're in a long on the predictive model saying, oh yeah, we are going to need that in three months and two months, blah 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 blah. Correct. That is a, that's exactly correct. And, and that's high value. So what kind of lead time would you anticipate from the hospital saying we need this, we need that? So the good news is what are, are with Northwell and North Mississippi and the Navy are three beta test sites. We got a lot of information. We know what they've been short of. They shared it with us. And so what we do is we've taken that, we've created a a menu that they get to select from, right? We don't sell them the drugs. We say, you can get, I'm just, I'm just telling you, we get 10,000 units, whatever it is per month. You get 10,000 units on your subscription and you can mix and match them however you need day by day, week by week. How long does it take to do that, to switch from a need for this prescription versus this one within the- Within the day. Unit, within the day. Within the day. Okay. They call me in the morning and said, oh shoot, we had five traumas roll in, we, we run out of fentanyl. Okay, we'll make you fentanyl. Okay. So if I'm a hospital, I, I, if I'm a hospital, and I buy a pod. Just go over that business again. So this you're not. So initially, I want to be clear here. I'd like to get to the point where we're selling the pod system with all of it, the chemistry and everything, uh, and then just be the supplier of the uh, of the of the of the of the, of the inkjet cartridges and, the, and and so on and so forth. That's what I like to be. I can't do that now, and it's for a very simple reason: FDA. So I've got to get past showing the FDA that I can do this distributed manufacturing. We're working in concert with them with our distributed manufacturing quality management system that we developed under DARPA leadership. The second thing is medical liability. We have to show the hospitals that, that, they, that this doesn't have high liability to it. You know, the what if peoples, the naysayers, of course, can come up with anything, but, the, well, but you have to demonstrate that you can produce every time the right, you know, meeting USP and FDA regulations, which we can, but we have to demonstrate it. That's why these beta sites, God bless them, are, are, are really great for us because they're going to generate revenue, but at the same time, we're generating data. And that data will be used to meet these questions. Right. Two uh, more questions. Uh, okay, so your uh, first ask is $25 million. Yeah. Uh, what do the uh, specialized VCs think about this? Stuff? Don't know. I just, getting, I just got started. Okay. I literally just got started. Is this, I is this is extraordinary. I mean, you know, your thinking on this is really an admirable. Thank okay, you. Doc. At least our takeouts from Big Pharma. But I, I, you know, I think that the the actuality when we get out on the logistics of the whole thing are going to be more Challenge. complicated than you. You know, and, and I, that's logistics fair. can that's be fair. solved. That's you fair. Know, they, that's they fair. They can be solved. 
Right, that's fair. That's How much fair. have you raised so far? Uh, so I've raised 13 million. And then uh, I think and, and, the and, and, and the DARPA and HHS investment yeah. and, and Navy, O and R, so DOD and HHS and, and DARPA have been our biggest supporters. <clears throat> right. 82.5 million. 82, okay. Of so, government non dilutive. Non -dilutive yeah. If anybody's stuttering, uh, studying, excuse me, the generic. I'm stuttering. Uh, yeah, <laughs> stuttering. I'm stuttering. I need more coffee. The generic drug uh, area, know certain people in it. You may have read about uh, Mark Cuban, Cross Plus Drugs. Um, Amazon Prime, pay five bucks a month, I guess, get all the generic drugs you need. This is a in an area that is really ready for disruption. And Dr. Ling and ODP is going to be a key part of that. I, one more question? Yeah, I was just going to ask yes, what your thoughts were about what Mark Cuban is up to. I think he's a genius. Yeah. He's a freaking yeah. genius. And But the thing is that I, and I'm, by the way, I'm talking to his folks uh, in, in a couple of weeks, thanks to DARPA um, and, and my friend Pete Thurlow. But the, but the point is, I see them as collaborators, quite frankly. So, quite frankly, I see those collaborators. You're going to have to source from somebody. So, so I, um, you know, he is largely supplying retail drugs. Right. You're not. You're we are not at this time. But, but the other thing is, you're largely going to be supplying injectables or you're going to do orals as well. We can do orals. Uh, we are. But, but, you, but, but, can I, you capsulate any tablets? I think, I, I believe that we can. But right now, you are correct. We're focusing on sterile injectables because that's what the biggest need is. It's how we get into the market. So, the st sterile injectables, you're right. Yeah, yeah. They have special reproduction so, so I want to come back to this because this is from a DARPA standpoint. You know, um, under uh, Dr. Ling, this company has been in self mode and just, you know, it's very disruptive. So we're really hoping that some of the best and brightest entrepreneurs and investors can partner with us. You know, we see a huge, tremendous opportunity. We, are, my team, we we have about four billion dollars of investments we go through every year, and we only pick some of the very best. And you got to see uh, Davide with with um, his company and Dr. Ling with ODP. And so I hope that Dr. <clears throat> Ling will be here later today too. Yeah, I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna yeah. close. I'm yeah. gonna say the goodbye to you guys. Parallel between these companies. Right. You're right. I want to say uh, on closing. I want to I want to finish with this last thing. The reason why I started this, I know we have to build a sustainable business model. I know that. But to your initial point long ago, is that in my mind, when I was in Afghanistan, I, by the way, I was sent there five times. So I was in, in Iraq as well. But, but I, when I was in Afghanistan, the thing that I admired most about the people I served with was this, when the US military went in and made safe a particular region, right behind came the PRTs, the Provincial Reconstruction Teams. Those are the combat engineers. And what did they do? They built a school, one room school, they built a latrine and they dug a deep well for that region, a deep well for clean water. That's what the US military left behind in these villages. What are those three things? Education, where boys and girls were educated together, clean water and sanitary. To leave a lasting peace, that's what it takes. It doesn't come out of a barrel of a gun, but they missed one thing, good health, good health. I want to drop my pod system in that village. And then the four pillars will be the basis of what could become a lasting peace. I want to do that everywhere in the world. I want to go to the crazy places that the army sent me. But that is how we create lasting peace. We don't talk about it. We do something about it. We science our way out of it. So I'm really hoping that somebody in this room will really want to join me on this journey.